As a civilization, when we solve the problems of physical scarcity, we introduce a very difficult psychological problem to ourselves, which is like, you're safe, you have everything you need, now who do you wanna be? The velocity of the success really made me feel trapped. I always feel weird when I talk about this on podcasts because what is more unrelatable than a guy who like sold 10 million books and then got depressed? What amazes me is that the solution's exactly the same. So here's the dirty little secret about all your favorite personal development authors. The reason we write the books we write is because it's the advice we need to hear ourselves. I found the conventional personal development approach to quote unquote improving yourself was a little bit naive. Everything is backwards. If you want to be happy, then don't chase happiness. If you want to stop being sad, let yourself be sad. Figuring out what to give a fuck about, it's a question that never ends because we're always growing and evolving and changing. The world is always growing and evolving and changing. And so you got to ask some of these questions. Hello, beautiful beings. Welcome back to the Know Thyself podcast, where every single week we get the honor and privilege to sit down with a brilliant mind and open heart to see how we can learn more about ourselves and the world around us. My guest today is a prolific author and content creator. He wrote the infamous book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, which has sold over 10 million copies and has been a huge success worldwide. I personally love how he approaches a lot of these perennial questions of life, such as what's our purpose, how to be happy, how to be fulfilled, but from an unexpected uh, lens that you typically don't find in the personal development world. So Mark Manson, thank you for coming on the show, my friend. It's great to be here. Yeah, I would love to start with the light topic, <laughs> death. Oh boy, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, getting to read some of your books and get more familiar w- with your work, you know, I, what stuck out, one thing that really stuck out was that you had a deep transformational moment when your your friend Josh passed um, mm-hmm. when you were a teenager. And um, I know that for me pers- firsthand, I feel the most alive in life when I'm closest to the realization of my own mortality. You yeah. know, when you feel that viscerally, that possibility uh, and, and how we are all mortal, uh, it, you become so present. It's like there's this immediacy that comes to it. Mm-hmm. And so could you share you know, a little bit about that time in your life, what unfolded, and how that radically changed who you are and how you view yourself. Sure. Um, Starting with the light topics here. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was 19, um, well, to back up just a little bit, like give you a sense of who I was as a teenager, I was I was very lost. I was stoner, lazy, failed classes, you know, very like, not only unmotivated to really pursue anything in life, but also um, too scared to actually pursue anything in life. And, um, but wasn't self-aware enough to realize that. Um, And so I I had a good friend named Josh and he was kind of a party buddy um, that I had at music school. And uh, we went went out to a lake party one July, and we were just having a good time. And it was, so there was like a swimming pool and it was on a cliff and the cliff was above the lake. And basically people were getting dr- drunk and jumping off the cliff into the lake and tons of people were doing it. So it seemed completely reasonable. And I even asked Josh, I was like, is this safe? Do people do this all the time? And he was like, yeah, people do it all the time. I was like, okay. And uh, a couple hours later, I went up to the house to get a snack came back, got distracted, came back down maybe 10, 20 minutes later, and there were ambulances, fire trucks, police everywhere, and the party had completely stopped. And long story short, um, in that like 20 minutes I was in the house, uh, Josh had jumped in and drowned. And, you know, not only that proximity to death, obviously that proximity to death is always a wake-up call of your own mortality and all the things that you take for granted in your life. There was something fundamentally shocking about the randomness of it um, and just the tragic proportions of it. I mean, the guy was like 21. We're literally just laughing and drinking beers together like 30 minutes prior, and then he's just gone. And for my young brain, it it really just like scrambled kind of everything I thought I knew about life. And... Um, went into like a a pretty intense depression for most of that year. 
trying to sort it out. And um, but it was interesting because I really, I eventually came out of it. Um, it's cliche to put it this way, but like very much like a, a carpe diem, like dude, stop wasting your life. Like, what the hell are you doing? You know, and stop, stop smoking pot every day. Start studying, like figure, pick something that you're going to pursue and like actually go pursue it. And, um, it ended up being, uh, it, it ended up having, I don't want to say it was a blessing, but it ended up having very positive consequences yeah. in my life. And I think also, experiencing such an immediate tragedy that early in my life, it made me, I find that most young people, well, most people period don't like to think about death, but especially young people. And I think it forced me at a very young age to start considering a lot of these questions. Um, and it eventually kind of sent me down more of a contemplative slash spiritual slash philosophical path in my life. And, um, and yeah, it was very formative. One of the most formative things that's ever happened to me. Yeah, I could only imagine. I think so often we just overlook the gift of what it means to have a life and to yeah. be human. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, we need to experience, well, it can be fortunate that we experience those unfortunate things in our life, whether it's a death of a loved one or you know a serious illness or something that like really is that wake up call that mm. like shakes us and like, Yo, bro, human, <laughs> you're alive in this body, and like it's, it, it, and you can you can radically transform yourself into a new way of operating and existing within yourself. Um, but oftentimes, a lot of people need to go through those tragedies to experience them. Yeah, and the weird thing about death too is that we all we treat it like this very rare, horrible thing when it's actually like literally the most common thing on earth. Yeah. <laughs> it is the it is like one of maybe only a handful of experiences that we are all going to have at some point and we're all going to lose loved ones at some point. We're all going to have tragedy at some point. Yet I find that most of us, most of the time, we kind of like delude ourselves into thinking that it's this, this very rare, horrible thing that, you know, if we don't talk about it, then it won't happen. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I have found that the opposite is actually the case that you should think about these things. Like you like my wife and I have had conversations before where, where we have both said, it's like, yeah, I actually, it's uncomfortable how much I imagine you dying mm. because, and it's a horrible thought, but I have it frequently. And it, and it's almost like mentally, A, mentally preparing yourself for the possibility, but B, it's also like, it prevents you from taking them from for granted. It yeah. prevents me from taking my marriage for granted. It's like every day, even if I didn't sleep well, even if, you know, she's nagging me about the trash or whatever it can like remind me of like this is one of the most important things in my life you know so don't don't overlook that the egoic human mind that is really one of the only things that's actually separate from all of the other existence around us is the suffering of that separation i feel like makes us fear our own death right mm -hmm. but you like you're speaking to it's so common it's so prevalent everything is going to experience it every living being will at some point but what I'm also really interested in is like, how can we not just wait for those big tragic moments, but how can mm -hmm. we in this moment have a perspective shift that allows an old identities, old identities to die and experience death in that? Because we are experiencing in ourselves, in our body, deaths every every single moment. Sure. Many, you know, we're just not aware of. And so as you've been on this path of supporting a lot of people um, in an industry that has been super saturated, but you found a way to really break through with a clear and unique voice because you're very creative and your I think your writing capabilities, like it's a beautiful gift that you have, largely to really support people into breaking this habit of who they've been and mm -hmm. the way that they've you know kind of viewed life. And so what have you learned about either in your own path but then also in supporting others have these kind of mini deaths of who we perceive ourselves to be? It's a great question because I, you know, I think, well, first of all, I think there's a lot of value in just developing kind of a mental habit of a thought experiment of if I died today, you know, or if I, if I died tomorrow, what would I think about my life? Or if I knew I had a month to live, what would I think about my life? Like, I, I, I think these are useful questions to periodically ask yourself. And, and I think there's a reason, you know, whether you look at Buddhism or the Stoics, like it is that those questions are a fundamental part of those practices and they've been around for thousands of years. Um, 
to your question about identity, you know, that's something I, I've been banging on that drum quite a bit, especially when I got started early in my career. So, you know, everybody wants to change something about themselves. Everybody wants to improve somehow. And, and I, I found this kind of the, the conventional personal development approach to quote unquote, improving yourself or changing yourself was, it was a little bit naive. Like it was all about this cool new habit or persona or skill that you were going to adopt for yourself. And oh my God, isn't your life going to be amazing? And one of the things I started writing about a long time ago is that for a real fundamental identity level shift to happen, it's not sufficient to simply adopt something new into your identity. You also have to kill off something old. And when you kill off that old part of yourself, there's a grieving process that you go through. Even if it's like a terrible, <laughs> it's a terrible thing. Like I went, when I stopped partying, which was horrible for me and I like wasn't enjoying for years when I stopped, there was a grieving process of like, who am I? If I'm not the party guy, who am I? If I'm not the one drinking with my friends, like why are my friends with me, right? Like there's all these very uncomfortable and kind of sad questions that pop up even when you eliminate a negative part of your identity. So I've I've long written that that this that identity change is not simply like, you know, hey, check out this new cool habit I've got, you know, aren't I amazing? It's it's like no, there's like there's a sadness when you let an old aspect of yourself go. And that sadness is okay. In the personal development world, I think partly also because of how plugged we all are on social media, seeing everybody's highlight reels constantly. Mm. But we think that like self-improvement and growth is just like, we just see the end result. We see the outcome. We see the puppies, rainbows and butterflies yep. and think, yeah. and in, re in reality, <laughs> to get to that point, it's a lot of the opposite. It's a lot of purging. It can be a lot of painful purging. It can be a lot of kind of existential questions of like, who am I? Will I still matter? Will people still love me? Um, and there's also a lot of boredom too, which also doesn't get publicized very often because it's boring. <laughs> yeah, because it's boring, right? Yeah. But it's, you know, a lot of personal change is just very dull. Like it's it's crossing your T's and dotting your I's and, you know, making very mundane decisions consistently. We just don't glorify those, right? But it's like, it's what we do in the dark that shines in the light. Mm -hmm. Nobody saw you for years and years writing yeah. uh, behind the scenes <laughs> before before you had this big breakthrough, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's like, whoa, this dude's an amazing author. Like, you should check him out. This new guy this, that's like has this beautiful new gift and sharing it in this way. And it's like, but do you understand <laughs> the years, the decades of of who you've been and, and the skills that you've developed and the ex life experience that you've gone through? Yeah. It, it's it's um I experienced a lot of that when Subtle Art took off because that was my first convention like book in the publishing world. And so in the publishing world, I was this hot new talent that had just been discovered. And oh my God, look how many copies he's selling. Where did he come from? And I used to get uh I used to do like media interviews and they would ask me, they're like, you know, wow, it's how does it feel to be an overnight success? And I'm like, <laughs> bro, I've been doing this for like nine years. Yeah. <laughs> so like this obscure blog on the internet. You just never heard of me until a month ago. Yeah. <laughs> it's so interesting, right? All the things that come with that level of impact and success, like to one of the large, to one of the largest degrees you can have success with the book, right? You experience with that. Um, it's beautiful for your work to get recognized. It's exciting for the ideas that you cherish and that you value and that you think are important to be planted, those seeds to be planted in the minds of millions and millions of people. That's got to feel so rewarding. What have you learned on the other side of the success and the impact about how it's actually correlated or not with your own happiness? Hmm. Because <laughs> a lot of people think they're just so intrinsically interwoven yeah. and that's not always the case. I think about it on two levels. So there's kind of like, for lack of a better term, a macro level, right? Which is, well, let me start on the micro level. So the micro level is that, yes, success is great and it brings a lot of joy into your life, but it also brings a lot of challenges and unexpected. A lot of those challenges are very unexpected and they they kind of like blindside you a little bit. Um, and so there are periods 
during success that it can be very difficult. And I think for certain people, depending on their background, how old they are, that it can even be a little bit of a curse. Like, we, you know, we all know of stories of people who got famous too young and bad things happen. Yeah. Um, so there is that, like on the micro level, there are challenges. On the macro level, it's like, I would never trade it. Like <laughs> there were brief, there were years in the last five years that it, it I struggled a lot and it kind of messed with me, but at no point would I ever be like, yeah, I want to go back and not be successful. I want to go back to like, right. you know, <laughs> asking my my girlfriend for rent money, you know, right. like <laughs> there, there's none of that. So um, there is that glorification of the old days too, which is like, so totally there's a not, nostalgia, right? Yeah. Of like, uh, but in reality, it, it sucked a lot too. <laughs> it, it was horrible. I would, yeah, it's, um, so the most accurate way I can answer this is, is simply that like, Yes, yeah, success will make your life better on the whole, but it's not like a linear thing. Like it's a very, there's a roller coaster and yeah, it trends upward, but there are down months and years and it can complicate a lot of problems in your life as much as, much as it solves problems sure. in your life. Sure, yeah, I'm sure you've had to continually redefine what success in general even means mm -hmm. to you because we're talking about it in the traditional sense of you know having career impact right sure and prosperity in that sec in that sense but you could be immensely successful in your career but feel like a failure internally you mm -hmm. know and oftentimes those are the driving mechanisms <laughs> to get to that place in the first you know yeah in the first way so um yeah how is your definition of what success really means turn into be something turn into becoming something that's just more holistic and I think one of the things that got me in trouble is, and I think this is a mistake a lot of people make, is, is having too narrow of a definition of success for myself, maybe not defining it on multiple metrics. You know, I think the same way it's, this is gonna be a cheesy metaphor, but like the same way, the same way you need to diversify an investment portfolio so that, you know, if the price of oil collapses tomorrow, you're not screwed, or if, the U.S. stock market collapses, you're not screwed. I think you need to diversify your value system and how you define success for yourself. Like you need to create success metrics. You you need to create multiple success metrics for yourself. Um, and I think I probably, I was so driven back then because I, I was young. I had a chip on my shoulder. I was like, and, and back then, it's like creators got zero respect. Like, I understand they're still kind of overlooked these days, but it's like there were no doors open anywhere. Like, it was like, oh, you have a blog? Like, good for you, <laughs> you know? And um, so there was, there was a big chip on our shoulder back then of like being one of the first people to have a door open to you in traditional media and taking it, and then it works. Um, so like my definitions of success were very kind of conventional metrics of like how many readers does my blog have? How much money is coming in each month? How many book sales? How many books am I selling? Am I on the New York Times list or not? And that's fine. Like I don't think there's anything wrong. I think those kind of like external materialistic metrics get a bad rap sometimes. I think it's fine to have those. It's fun to have those in a lot of cases. You, it's just that you can't only have those. <laughs> you need to have, you need to also have this other set of success metrics for yourself, um, you know, of, of impact, of meaning, of fostering community for yourself. And I definitely overlooked that uh, 10 years ago, for sure. And I, I ended up paying the price for that because once you hit the worldly materialistic metrics, um, you know, you get a trophy, you get a big check in your bank account, and then you're you wake up, you're still the exact same person, <laughs> and you're like, oh shit, now what do I do? <laughs> you know, so if you haven't built up those other success metrics, you know, if you haven't built a strong community around yourself, if you're not having impact on people, like if you're not doing something you feel is very meaningful every day, then you're gonna feel a little bit lost, and um, and I I definitely did for a while mm. for sure. That shift because. Contrary to the initial perception, maybe seeing the the title of the first book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, mm -hmm. like you 
most people think, all right, I should there I shouldn't care about all these things, but and on the contrary, you're really speaking to how we should really find what we really give a shit about. What are the things that truly yeah. have meaning to us? What can we actually really deeply value? And so how important for you has it been uh, to discover what your true values are, what really has meaning for you in order to actually have a fulfilling life? Well, so here's the dirty little secret about all your favorite personal development authors is like the reason we write the books we write is because it's the advice we need to hear ourselves mm. and we suck at taking that advice ourselves. Yeah. And it's it's I have so many author friends who like continually screw up the thing that they wrote a best-selling book about. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we all joke with each other of like, you know, oh, but you're like so and so, you're supposed to be perfect with this and you know. It is self-help, I guess. It's yeah, it is very literal. Right? It's, it's the first person's being helped right. is this guy. <laughs> um, so it's it's um, the thing about the subtle art, and I think this is something that gets overlooked a lot from that book, is that this, so first of all, you're correct. It's not about being indifferent. It's not about not caring about anything. It's about very consciously choosing the things that you care about because you have a limited amount of fucks to give. And so if you just give them about everything, then you're going to feel very lost. And um, and the thing about it is that you don't, figuring out what to value or what to give a fuck about, it's not, it's a question that never ends because we're always growing and evolving and changing. The world is always growing and evolving and changing. And so it's a question you have to, I, I almost consider it like, spiritual hygiene, right? It's like the same way you got to brush your teeth every day or else you, shit's going to start rotting out. Like you got to ask some of these questions consistently, regularly, uh, including like the death questions, right? It's like, what do I care about? Is this worth caring about? What is, are there other things that are probably more worth my time and energy? Um, what if, like, what am I grateful for in my life? If I died next month, like how would I feel about my life right now? Like these are just consistent questions that you're never going to stop asking because it's the practice of asking them is what keeps you on track. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I definitely got, um, you know, after the book took off and everything and the career went bananas, like I definitely got a crash course and, and taking my own medicine. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because our, our behaviors are intrinsically connected to our values. And so mm -hmm. a lot of times if you ask people like, what do you value? They would have to probably think about it because most people don't think about that, that sort of thing. Sure. But we all do have our values and often just subconsciously we're, we're holding on to them. They've been passed down to us. If you look at somebody's behaviors and results, it's going to be trickle down effect from their, the, what they actually value. Right. Totally. It's, it's behaviors never lie. And What's funny is that a lot of people, even if you do think about your values, a lot of people will give you an answer that's just not correct. Like a lot of times we're not aware of our own values, right? So like what you know, value sounds good. Exactly. So somebody would be like, oh, most important value in my life is family. Meanwhile, they're working like 90 hours a week and are on the road six months a year and have missed all their kids' birthdays, right? And it's like, okay, you know, right. is it really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's 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 another one of those things that it's, we can easily trick ourselves and delude ourselves. Yeah. It, it's just, I, I get the image of just for, for me and my own personal path, like there's definitely been times where I've also been on that journey. Like we all go through ups and downs of saying mm -hmm. that we really value something, but then our behaviors don't necessarily reflect what we actually say to ourselves. And so question comes into, okay, once you have that awareness, right, which is the first step, then can you stop bullshitting yourself? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's ever possible to completely stop bullshitting yourself. I think you can get better at it yeah. uh, and bullshit yourself less, but I don't know if any of us like ever completely nail it. Interesting. I think this is, this is one of the reasons why it's so, so, so important to have a really good group of people around you who are also very aware and that you're able to have open and honest communication with, because it's like, if something misses my own bullshit filter, then my wife's is likely to catch it or one of my good friends is likely to catch it um, and vice versa. And so it's it's extremely important to have that network around you to kind of like reinforce these systems in yourself. A quick share from today's sponsor. 
I'm a warm beverage kind of guy. <laughs> I like my tea, cacao, and other products like from our sponsor today, Mudwater. Mudwater is a coffee alternative with adaptogenic mushrooms and Ayurvedic herbs. With only a fraction of the caffeine as a cup of coffee, you get the energy without the jitters or crash. Their original blend has chai and cacao, mushrooms like lion's mane to support focus, and chaga and reishi to support your immune system. I personally also love to use the rest blend as a part of my nighttime ritual. It has no caffeine and ingredients like ashwagandha and chamomile to help you chill out. I add a little bit of honey and coconut creamer and boom, you are in business. Everything is 100% organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and delicioso. <laughs> I love what this company stands for, how they believe in creating healthy minds through healthy habits and how they donate monthly to mental health causes. To try them out, you can go to mudwtr.com slash know thyself and use code know thyself for 15% off. And they'll even throw in a free rechargeable frother. As always, everything is linked down in the description below. Back to the episode. But I want to talk a little bit about, because it's also tied into all of what we're talking to here, this idea that you kind of shared in your book, which is the, the paradox of progress, right? There's sure. like this inverse effect that we think as societally and also just in our own lives, as we find more success, as we do better, that everything else in our life will kind of find this, this you know, this euphoric rise with it. Mm -hmm. But often the case, uh, like you spoke to many times, it's just like we've often traded our physical struggle for the psychological struggle. Sure. And, uh, and so anything you want to speak to and just share a little bit more about what that is? Yeah, so most of my second book, uh, Everything is Fucked, is, is about this, which is- <laughs> I love your book title. <laughs> Everything is Fucked, the book about hope. That book is definitely not as commercially appealing as the subtle art, but I think in terms of like importance- for me at the time, like that book is actually more important because that book is kind of like a thinly veiled therapy session for myself. Um, so so to to answer your question about the paradox of progress, there, there's this fascinating thing in psychological research that finds that basically the wealthier and more abundant a country is, the higher the rates of mental health issues, suicide, depression, anxiety, uh, almost across the board. And it's actually, they've like, they've studied it, like it happens so consistently, like you can take a city and you can kind of map the areas of the city and by wealth and abundance and resources and the wealthiest parts of the city will have the greatest suicide rates, greatest rates of depression, greatest rates of mental illness. So. It's this paradox of like, the better our life gets, the more we seem to kind of freak out or the larger percentage of people kind of like freak out and have these existential psychological crises around it. And meanwhile, at the same time, I was going through the same thing. I just experienced like an amount of success that exceeded all my wildest dreams. And yet I'm like this like insecure, neurotic, anxious mess you know, trying to, trying to write this new book. So I kind of like that book, like almost like wrote me out of my own angst and, and depression. But what, what I ended up, the conclusion I ended up coming to is that, you know, the, as a civilization, when we solve the problems of physical scarcity, you know, having enough food, enough shelter, protecting ourselves from wild animals and the elements and everything, like once we give ourselves enough physical abundance that we no longer have to spend our entire lives worrying about our own survival, we introduce a very difficult psychological problem to ourselves, which is like, okay, you're safe, you have everything you need, now who do you wanna be? Well, that's a hard fucking question. It's a terrifying fucking question for most people. And so it's almost like, it's such a privileged question, but at the same time, it's so psychologically difficult. And I don't think we acknowledge that or we're very aware of that trade-off, right? Like if you are living in poverty, say in sub-Saharan Africa, it's easy to know who you are. It's easy to know what you want every day. Like you have no choice, right? So your physical life is difficult, but psychologically, you know why you're waking up every morning you know what you're working on. You know what success means for you. And you know who you care about. 
if you live a super privileged life in, say, L.A., and you have all these great things and all these opportunities and all this education and you know all these amazing people, these questions of like, who am I? Who am I going to be? What do I want to do with my life? Is this more meaningful than that? Is this making more impact than that? Maybe I should have done that over there. It tortures you. It like it can absolutely eat you alive. And so the the paradox of progress is I don't necessarily have a, a clean solution for it, but I think you know, I tried to simply express what the problem is and put words to, I think, what a lot of our generation is experiencing. Um, growing up with all the education and abundance and technology that we grew up with, yeah, it, it does complicate knowing who you want to be in the world. So much of that suffering, right, is just tied to our own self-centered self-appointed importance mm. and how special we think we are. And so counterintuitive, most people think that once you have access to a level of abundance or resources that, you know, and of course, a lot of your problems do get solved. It's easier to take care of yourself if you get sick. You know, mm. you can afford healthier food and a nice gym and like a lot of these things. But really, we need a lot less to take care of ourselves <laughs> than we think we do. Yeah. And that psychological struggle that we find ourselves where we're in the space now, a lot of things become possible, but we're also just so uncertain as to where what direction we should grow, go in. Yeah. I almost said like grow in, but like that's also a really big part of it, right? What, what do we feel like we're um, contributing to the world? And then how do we feel like we're actually growing? Because I know for me, I'm most happy when I feel like I'm making progress and growth internally and externally in my sure. life. You know, there's this upward trajectory of feeling like there's this usefulness. I feel like I'm being used by life in a good way, in a <laughs> yep. sense. And I think that once you get to this place where if you make a lot of money or you become very successful and you don't have something that's really meaningful to your heart, like mm -hmm. that you feel like is a service to the world and to get out of your own bubble of your own mental constructs of just like about yourself, but like, to get out there and to go support and to serve and find things that have meaning to you, I think is just is just so valuable and important. Yeah. Um, so for you, for you, when you had ma your massive success and you find yourself still in a depressive state, yeah. How did you actually get out of that? Because in hindsight, when you look back at that period of your life, there's these ideas of how to cure depression and how to you know mm. move beyond that state. But when you look at the things that you actually did, what were the things that really moved the needle in terms of your own experience? from before the success and then even after the success? The first thing I did is I took a little bit of time off. I was like, you know, I've been working my ass off for eight, nine years, like let's chill for a little bit. And I think that was helpful for maybe like a month. <laughs> but then I was like, okay, I need to do something. I can't just sit around for the rest of my life. Uh, and eventually I just kind of came to the conclusion, what I realized is that the the velocity of the success really kind of made me feel trapped. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, when you're, let's say you're progressing on a goal and this, it doesn't have to be a career or money or whatever. It can be anything. It's like, we kind of have this mental expectation that as time goes on, you're going to experience in incremental improvement over a steady period of time. And that feels good. It's like, I'm better this week than I was the week before. Awesome. Feel great. You know, this month went better than last month. Amazing. Um, it's when you get these crazy exponential swings in fortune that I think really like kind of breaks our brain a little bit. So it's like kind of imagine you're going along and every year is five to 10% better than the year before. And you do that for almost 10 years. And then the next year is 10,000% better. And you're like, well, wait a second. What the hell did I do? Like, <laughs> where did this come from? And you start asking all these questions like, did I get lucky? Is, is it a fluke? Um, I'm never going to be able to do this again, right? So there's that insecurity and anxiety. Uh, and so it just really starts scrambling with your head. And there's a lot of imposter syndrome mixed in. And, and suddenly you've got all these you know, you've got agents and publicists and publishers and people in Hollywood are like calling you and expecting all this stuff. And, and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like I, I wasn't expecting this all so fast. And, um, I basically just came to the conclusion. I was like, okay, look, I can either be miserable and do nothing, 
or I can be miserable and work. So I might as well be miserable and work and like work myself my my way out of it. Cause I was like, you know, if I just get like the next couple projects out of the way and watch them do 10% as well as this last project, it's gonna hurt and I'm gonna be really sad about it, but it's okay. Life will go on and and I'll get over it. And I think that's more or less what happened. It's just coming to terms with like, yeah, this crazy outsized thing happened in my life. It doesn't need to define me. It doesn't need to be who I am. Like one of the best conversations, so this kind of ties back into like having a good network around you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> some of my best friends are psychologists and therapists. And I was had dinner with a friend one night who's a therapist. And, uh, and I was kind of telling him like how stuck I felt. And he was like, look, you're thinking about your life in terms of like you like if it's a chart you have all these like little experiences down here and then you have this one experience up here and you're like freaking out that nothing's ever going to be that high again and he's like but you have to realize that there's going to be dots all over the chart stretching 50 60 years into the future he's like you don't even know if that's the highest or not you're your metrics of how you measure success could completely change and that becomes one of the lowest dots right like yeah. so he's like you're you're assuming all these things are true about your life that you actually have no idea if they're true or not and all you can do is just keep showing up and doing the work and putting out stuff that feels good and important at the time um and so i did and i it, it was just in that process of working and trying to focus on what it was true and important to me and not trying to match the previous success that eventually kind of liberated me. It's so interesting. I think not a lot of people are really, very few people are, are able to experience that form, I guess, of depression that comes by mm -hmm. massive success, you know? Um, and I think it's interesting to see how when you have that level of success, you realize how important it was for you because you put so much of your self-worth on reaching that same level or like you just realize how much weight you've been putting on to uh, your career and like uh, who you are and the things that you find meaningful all kind of attached to external appreciation. Totally. And when that's up for grabs and you don't know which direction that's going to go into, it's like it becomes unsettling. For individuals that are maybe on the other side, maybe mm -hmm. they're they're they have like they don't have any success. They feel like there's nothing yeah. positive coming into their life externally. They just feel like an internal kind of hole, and and they wake up and they're just like not motivated. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I just want to you know state again that you shared was like how important it is to be surrounded by individuals mm -hmm. and have that network because like. You know, we're fortunate enough to be in the space where we can have friends that are therapists sure. and psychologists, and that's beautiful. Uh, but then also just cultivating community. It's like we're so isolated to such a large degree that we don't really realize comparatively to how like we biologically have evolved. Yeah. Um, but what uh, what general uh, advice have you given that that you've seen supported for individuals that are kind of on that side of things? Well, it's funny. <laughs> so <laughs> I always feel weird when I talk about this on podcasts, right? Because what is more unrelatable than a guy who like sold 10 million books and then got depressed? Like that's, <laughs> I always feel like, oh, boo-hoo, poor me, right? But what amazes me from like a, a psychological perspective, what amazes me is that the exact same thing fixes it on both ends, right? When your life changes positively so fast that it scrambles your identity and fucks your ego and puts you into a depression or whether your life goes wrong so fast it scrambles your identity and fucks your ego and puts you into depression the solution's exactly the same you just you show up you focus on small wins piece by piece you surround yourself by some good people um and you take it step by step and you you slowly do the work of disidentifying from that massive event that happened and realizing that that doesn't necessarily define your life or define who you are, which is crazy. It's the same in both directions. And so to me, it's, it's, it almost, this is, this is why I've, I've written about how like the directionality almost doesn't even matter. Like what fucks with our heads is the magnitude of change. Like our, our psychology seems to only be kind of prepped for a certain amount of change at a time. And when we exceed that rate of change, when something something so massive and drastic changes our lives so quickly, 
whether it's tragic or super fortunate, um, it takes us a couple years to like mentally catch up and redefine ourselves and redefine our values and understand like what we're going to pursue and what we're going to care about. Um, so to me, that, that I don't know, that's just, a, maybe it's just me, but I, I find that really fascinating. Absolutely. Regardless like that in, in your book as well, you spoke to it backward, the backwards law, right? Yeah. And how, I would love for you just to dive into a little bit more why negativity is kind of the pathway to positivity. Because mm. a lot of times, especially just in modern society that we live, we just have so many things completely backwards Yeah. Um, in terms of if we want a more positive experience of life, let's just chase more positive feeling experiences. Yeah, but yeah. oftentimes that pain comes on the other side, right? So it's like choosing the pain first kind of flips that on its head in its way. So um, why is that such a fundamental perspective shift that we should have who want to actually um, have a positive experience of life. Yeah. Well, I, I think, so the backwards law for people who haven't read the book, it's, um, I describe it as, it actually comes from Alan Watts, but I, I kind of simplified it and crammed it in the one sentence, which is the pursuit of a positive experience is itself a negative experience and the acceptance of a negative experience is itself a positive experience. And I think what a lot of people get in trouble with is, as you said, they are so fixated on pursuing positive experiences that they actually make themselves miserable because they're constantly reinforcing and reminding themselves of everything they don't have. And um, which is just kind of the most fundamental definition of suffering in Buddhism. And um, whereas it's that acceptance of like, you know, life is pain, this is difficult, don't resist it, it's gonna be okay. That mental experience in and of itself becomes liberating. And I think I think it's particularly important in the modern world because so much of the modern world is geared and optimized around pursuing the thing you want, right? So it's like, if you want a degree, it's here are the steps to go get it. If you want to build a business, here are the steps to go get it. If you want to find a relationship, here are the steps to go do it. It's like in everything else in our life, you have this established goal and then you just kind of like figure out what the steps one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight are to get to that thing. That works for everything in life except for our own internal state. It's like, if I decide I want to be happy, okay, what are the steps to happiness? Okay, I got to do these eight things to be happy. I'm making myself miserable. <laughs> Just by thinking about that, I am actively making myself miserable. Uh, so it's, it's when it comes to our internal states, everything is backwards. It's if you want to be happy, then don't chase happiness. If you want to stop being sad, let yourself be sad. It And it's, it's very l difficult to logically kind of wrap your head around it, but when you experience it, and I think this is a lot of like, you know, what meditation is kind of training you to do is when you experience it, you you see how it works and and you kind of develop a skill of being able to relax into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that experience of that is like the most valuable thing, right? Yeah. Because you can have the intellectual idea of of that and it sounds great. It yeah. sounds tantalizing, <laughs> <Sure>. you know? <laughs> but but then again, you put it into practice and you experience when something negative comes into your life mm -hmm. and instead of resisting it, which is like you think you don't want a thing, so you resist it and that'll stop you from having the thing. But then you're just preoccupied and stopping the thing, which is a shitty experience, yeah. right? Yeah. And so this alternate understanding your perception of letting go as a pathway to more uh, mm -hmm. is is very backwards for <laughs> modern society, you sure. know? But it is so potent, it's so powerful, and it's a real experience that you can feel and that you can actually cultivate and start to um, harness that, that understanding more yeah. in your daily life. I got another one for you. Please. Uh, real freedom is found in limitation, which is, this one, it took me like well into my thirties to like really understand. But I think it's arguably as important, maybe even more important, especially in the social media age where you're supposed to have everything, do everything, be everything. Um, I think at some point in the last 10 or 20 years, we've mistaken freedom with optionality. Mm. And when they're actually two very different things. And <laughs> the problem is, is 
when you have optionality, let's say you have all these amazing opportunities or let's use the simplest example. It's like people you want to date, right? It's like, oh, I've got all these great people I can date. That's so amazing. I have all this freedom. But then you don't actually want to put any effort into any single one because then that limits your other options, right? You're giving up time and energy. And if you're monogamous, you're giving up, yeah. you know, op- my opportunities. Friend, my friend calls this the potential's palace. <laughs> <laughs> right? So what is that optionality actually getting you? It's actually preventing you from having the thing you actually want, which is a meaningful relationship. And I think this happens on all sorts of different levels and all, all sorts of different like walks of life. Um, I mean, you, you even see it, the, one of the examples I refer to and everything is fucked is like in marketing research, like they find that if you give, you know, like let's, let's say you want to buy cereal. If you give people an option, like two cereals and then they pick one, they'll be happy with whatever they pick. They're like, yeah, I got the one I wanted. If you give them 10 cereals to choose from and they pick one, they'll actually be way less happy, even though they had way more cereal to choose from. And they probably objectively got one that is more to their taste, they will be less satisfied with the decision because they're so aware of the nine that they gave up. It's it's so interesting as well. I, I just think of like in our own daily life as well, when we think that happiness will come from being able to do whatever we want, whenever we want, yeah. right? And if you follow that path for not very long, you'll see how much lethargy you develop in your system. It's when, empty. It's when, very empty. When you're on Netflix and you get a bucket of ice cream and then you eat some popcorn <laughs> and then you jerk off and then it's like, it can be a never ending cycle of this hedonic treadmill, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and you will feel very not free on the other end of doing that. Mm-hmm. First, if you actually cultivate some discipline in your life and you create these boundaries for yourself, limitation, actually creating those boundaries for yourself um, and implement those healthy habits and whatnot that might be a little um, sucky to endure, like a cold plunge or a sauna mm-hmm. or a workout, right? But then you experience the freedom that you feel on the other side of that, yep. right? Yeah. So. And it's very it's very backwards. <laughs> it doesn't make a whole lot of logical sense. The backwards law. <laughs> Didn't you name another law after yourself? Yeah, I, I created a Manson's law of avoidance. That's pretty cool. Yeah, which which <laughs> ties into the the you know the positive and negative thing. You know, I, I said that uh, we will avoid we will avoid experiences in proportion to how much it threatens our identity or threatens our ego, which is why we not only avoid negative experiences but we also avoid positive experiences because that new job opportunity or that you know cool new person who wants to hang out with you like we sabotage that because it'll challenge how we see ourselves. Mm. I think uh, I want to dive deeper here on this because I think it's a really fundamental, like the, how our identity functions in our life is Mm. like the controlling force metric in which kind of everything else happens, you know? And so we have, you know, if we have a self-limiting belief pattern of self-worth, you know, not feeling good enough, uh, imposter syndrome, whatever it might be, we're going to see the behavioral compensations on the on the surface of how that manifests itself in yeah. self sabotaging relationships and whatever you know whatever the case is, but getting back down into the root of how I view myself, which is often a byproduct of trauma that we're unconscious of that kind of mm-hmm. stores is stored in our somatic body, right? Um, what have been some of the biggest, I guess, narratives that you feel like people hold onto within their identity that? I want to go into some of the more gross, you know, how this turns into, you know, cults and different things like that as well. Sure. But also just giving us a slightly more shitty experience of life. Yeah. You know, it's like a pebble <laughs> in our shoe that keep us a little bit more trapped and limited versions of ourselves. Yeah. I think, so ultimately, I, I kind of think of identity as, you know, like rubber band balls, you yeah. know, like it, there's kind of just this endless amount of rubber bands. Um I think of each of those rubber bands as like a narrative, right? And as the ball starts when we're a very young child and it eventually gets covered with other bands and you know, by the time you get to an adult and you even realize you have a rubber band ball, you can't see the 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 core of it anymore because it's just covered by too many there are too many narratives stacked on top of narratives stacked on top of narratives. And so I think any sort of therapeutic practice whether it's conventional therapy or some spiritual practice or journaling or, you know, whatever it may be, it's what you're doing is you're just kind of like pulling the bands off and seeing what's underneath. And, and ideally, you know, 
getting to a point where it's like, if you do see a narrative that is probably harming you, you can do some work to kind of like pull it out. And, um, but that, that's, a, it's an extremely arduous and emotionally difficult because I think each of those narratives is emotionally laden. Like the, the, the whole thing that decides whether a thing is going to be become part of our rubber band ball or not is how emotionally powerful it is, both positive or negative, right? So it's like, if you, uh, let's say when you're a kid, you, I don't know, win like a piano recital and win an award and ev- your whole family's there and everybody's cheering and it's like this really great memory and experience that you have, that puts a little rubber band in your ball that says like, okay, you're musically talented and you like to perform for people and this is what gets you validated by others and that becomes like kind of a core narrative deep in your identity. That's a positive memory. If you experience some some degree of trauma when you're a kid, you're abused or bullied um, or abandoned by somebody, same thing. It's very emotionally powerful. It sticks with you. That becomes a narrative that gets wrapped very deep within your rubber band ball. And so it's any, but anything that's not emotional, you know, it's like, oh, you got to be on your spelling quiz in fourth grade. Like nobody remembers. So it's like, it's not in the rubber band ball. It doesn't matter. Nobody cares. So it's emotion. I think the most important thing to realize is that um, identity is formed proportionally to how important an event is in our life and the importance of an event in our life is largely determined by how emotionally impactful it was Yeah, uh, when it happened. And this is just, it's, it's something we all have got. We've all got those negative narratives buried deep inside um, some more than others, but we all have them. And, and I, I think just developing the, a, the awareness is kind of step one of that these narratives exist and kind of spending a significant amount of your time as an adult kind of like peering into the ball and pulling a band up and seeing what's underneath it. Um, I think that's important. But, it, you know, eventually you also want to... Um, okay, so here's where the metaphor is going to start falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> we made it this far. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think what you start to realize, and I think this is maybe where I differ from a lot of people in the personal development space, I don't believe you can pull out every narrative, especially deep down. Like if mm. you try to pull out one of those rubber bands like deep in the middle of the ball, the whole ball is going to come undone. Um, and so some some of those narratives are so lodged in there and they're so core and fundamental that um, it's not about getting rid of them. And I think this is particularly true and important when it comes to trauma. It's you're never going to be a person who didn't have a tra- traumatic experience. You can't. You can become somebody who had a traumatic experience and made peace with it, and are comfortable with it, and have become better because of it. Right? Like that is your option. Option A is never your option. Like, <laughs> like you you have to like delude yourself to be you know to to experience option A. So, I think it's it's ultimately the um the exercise isn't necessarily to like pull out some of these deep layer these deep narratives about our identity it's more to just recognize that like you can rewrite those narratives as an adult you can reinterpret the meaning you can alter your understanding of yourself um i think some of the external narratives the the shallower narratives of like you know 10 years ago i thought i was going to be a musician now i'm a writer right like it's that's an easy one to pull off and put a different band on right but the, the deeper ones, um, I think it's a lot of people kind of bang their head against the wall, spending a lot of years trying to rip one of those narratives out. I think it's so, it's a really important point that you brought up because a lot of people get on that path of <clears throat> continuing to excavate those deep emotional things. And on some level, like there's just this deep well of unconscious material that you mm-hmm. could say is processed within the collective in general that you could keep on pulling from and you don't even know what's yours anymore, right? Yeah, that's that's the danger too, is like once you get deep enough, it's it's very, very hard to know what is actually there and what you're just kind of rationalizing mm-hmm. afterwards, right? It's like, um, 
you know, it's like, oh, I'm I'm impulsive around food. Is that because my mom didn't cook for me enough, or is it because I just I'm fucking impulsive. Like, you know, it does it even matter, right? It, it's like, I think we can, there's a certain threshold where you can just start um, navel gazing. Sure. You know, there's a fine line between actually doing the work and just navel gazing and um, self obsessing. And it's it's hard to know kind of which, which side of that you're on sometimes. It's like that never ending wheel of self improvement can be so exhausting mm-hmm. when real freedom actually comes in the acceptance of self and like whatever those rubber bands are that you're pulling, like yep. that is actually where the freedom comes in in experiencing that. And you know, you could look at also the Advaita Vedanta approach of realizing that there's no ball to begin with, yeah, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> which is also, I think that they're both useful perspectives and sure. that you know, it can help to look at look under the hood to see what characterological defects that we've picked up that are making us suffer in our relationships and different things. But Absolutely. if you're just doing that work and you're also not doing the self-acceptance work and doing the work that kind of wakes you up beyond the illusion of self to begin with, then yeah. I feel like it's just a never ending wheel. It's just like a rat, rat wheel, rat race that you're just going to continue down for the rest of your life. And that is exhausting yep. as well. So it's like, yeah, a little bit of both the balance. Yeah. And, and again, I think it's kind of like the, um, like the bullshitting yourself, like you can get better at it. You're never going to solve it. Like there's no person on earth who's like completely sorted out all their trauma and baggage and mm-hmm. emotional issues. Like it's just, it's impossible. And um, and to your point, I think that is where the spiritual perspective starts to become very useful because it's like, yeah, it's all game, dude. Like it's, <laughs> you don't need to fix it. It's it's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it can also be extremely dangerous on that path if you go too far down without, you know, you just say it's all Maya, it's all an illusion, right? And, yeah. Um, but like th- that middle way where you're actually um, working through those characterological defects, but then you actually can wake up and create distance between you and your thought and emotion, which you're so closely identified with. Yeah. Like, I feel like that's where the real freedom comes in. And that can be an authentic experience. You just don't want to authentically bypass to that intellectual narrative that that's sure. what you should do, right? Because then anything can become a form of avoidance, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's, yeah, you can, you can rationalize anything into, <laughs> yeah, into, into an excuse to like push the pain sure. down. When have you felt, like you've gotten a, the closest glimpse to the center of that Tootsie Pop. Well, like <laughs> yeah, that, that there's that soul energy that wants to, that's a creative life force energy that wants to be shared with the world. Mm-hmm. I question sometimes if all of our desires come from some form of conditioning, one or the other, you know, I'd be curious to yeah. hear your thoughts on that. Or do you feel like there's this kind of divine desire that can, that's like a, you know, the bigger source of in, inspiration that can come oh, through? Man. I separate kind of the spirit, the spiritual questions from the more psychological questions. I, I do understand there's like a there's overlap, and but I almost think of it as like our psychology is kind of this arbitrary piece of software that's running in our brain, and you know the spiritual perspective is what points out that it's just an arbitrary piece of software. It's not real. It's just being like spun up, and um, and you don't necessarily have to buy into it nor necessarily should you always buy into it but you can't you also can't turn it off so you have to learn how to like navigate within it i guess that that's kind of how i see these two things fitting together you know my 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 history with that kind of perspective so the i guess the first time i took a shitload of lsd when i was 17 and uh for lack of a better term like saw god for a few hours and it's funny. So I was raised, let's back up even further. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> um, I was raised in a very conservative part of Texas. And so church was like a very, it was like a daily part of my life when I was growing up. And I never liked it. I didn't identify with, I didn't understand it. It all didn't make sense to me. I was not like very into the Bible or Jesus at all. And I was actually very resentful Um growing up in that environment because it was like constantly forced on me. And so I decided, I think when I was like 11 or 12 that I was atheist and that this whole God thing was bullshit. Um, Jump ahead to being 16 or 17, started taking psychedelics. And then I had this experience one night where uh, I basically, you know, just complete ego dissolution, 
just sat there on my front porch for, I mean, my friend later told me it was a few hours, just like fucking one with the universe, full like Lucy in the sky with diamonds shit. And uh, it's unbelievable. Like absolutely, you know, top five most formative experiences uh, of my life because I came out of that being like, okay, maybe I'm not Christian, but like there's something going on here, right? Like this, it's not, it's not all just atoms and <laughs> atoms and, and and energy and um and so that's when I got very interested in in religion and Eastern spirituality and meditation and I found I started meditating a lot when I was like eighteen or nineteen and I what I found when I went on my first retreat I did like a weekend retreat and what I found was that meditating for a long period of time was the only thing that kind of got me close to how I felt that night. And so to me, that was like, ah, I'm on the right track here, right? So I got very into uh, Buddhism and meditation for probably four or five years. And I had another retreat that was a few days long. And I think towards the end of that, like, I could kind of access it for a little bit, little brief periods of time, brief moments, like kind of wisps of the, the experience. Um, but it was funny because I started to feel myself getting very attached to that, you know, of like, well, shit, my, my next retreat's got to be 10 days because I got to get more of that, right? Like I got to get back to that. And then I, at some point it was just like, whoa, dude, you're doing, you're doing the exact thing that you're, you're getting attached, right? Like you're chasing something. And the whole point of a meditation practice is to not chase things. And um, so I, 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 I eventually, you know, throughout my 20s, my life got way more complicated, started traveling, living abroad, started a business, all this stuff. So I kind of lost track with that practice. But I feel like it's always informed my perspective quite a bit. Um, and there's a reason why I mentioned the Buddha in my books repeatedly because it's, I do think, again, that simple awareness of like, and choose whatever metaphor you want, rubber band ball or arbitrary piece of software, you know, it's like just the simple awareness of like, it's just made up. Like it's all just, it's a game. You know, this whole concept of this is Mark and this is Andre, uh, like constructs. It's, it's just, yeah, it's completely, it's like drawing a line in the sand and a wave's gonna come and wash it away. So it's, there is some amount of emotional comfort in that at times, and that can be useful. But I think it's, it's where, where I find it to be useful is, you know, in some of these kind of more profound existential questions around like, if I start kind of getting super stressed out about my life or what am I doing with my life or who do I want to be in the world or, um, you know, returning to that perspective is, I find is helpful because it's for whatever reason, when we start stressing and get anxious, our world gets smaller and those lines feel way more real. Those lines in the sand, they feel permanent. Mm. And, um, and so it's, it's, there's something about the spiritual perspective that keeps the rubber bands loose in the ball. Like they don't, they, it keeps them from like solidifying and you know, becoming like concrete. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, I just, I think it's incredibly valuable. Now, when you've kind of, you've had those practices, you've had those experiences that have blasted you out and kind of like shaked up your preconceived notion of what life is and mm -hmm. just into a more vast horizon of, of possibility. When you have, oftentimes I think, you know, when you have a massive success or things that just kind of, they're way bigger than you. Like the creation kind of surpasses you. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes come as a byproduct from tapping into a a source that is bigger than you. And like mm -hmm. having a, a connection of just like, to take it out of the esoteric woo woo, just like a level of like inspiration from life that feels very connected to all of life and not feels like it just, there's less of you doing it. Now, yeah. of course, 
you got to sit down on a laptop, you got to write the damn book, right? <laughs> yeah. You got to do the research, you got to put the thing as that and synthesize it in a, in a proper yeah. context. Uh, but is there anything else you want to speak to in, in terms of finding that thing for whoever is listening to this, whether it's writing, whether it's podcasting, whether it's music, yeah, you know, finding, being able to find that thing that you feel like is a unique combination of your unique skill sets, gifts, but then it's also service to the world in a way that's fulfilling. Yeah, it's a great question because what I find, and this was absolutely true for myself, you know, the the first thing I I tell people is try to find things that you think are easy or normal that most people think are difficult. And because what I, what I find a lot is that the things that people are very passionate about or find a lot of purpose in, they don't even realize it because it feels so natural to them that it doesn't even occur to them that this is something unique to themselves. Like I used to write, so back back in back in the old days, <laughs> but before social media was what it is today, you know, people used to write on forums. And um, so I used to be a part of a bunch of music forums. And I was that guy on the forum who like, if you said anything dumb or wrong, I was going to write like a five page <laughs> dissertation explaining point by point, like why you're wrong. Here's the evidence. Here's why, blah, 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 blah. And um, it, it never occurred to me that that's not normal. Like I did that for years and I just, that was like my idea of a cool thing to do on a Saturday night. And, um, and it wasn't until I actually, like I, I moved in with a couple new roommates and one of my roommates was actually on some of these forums. It's like, dude, you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the no, thing no. he said to me is he's like, how do you write such long posts? And I was like, what mm. do you mean? He's like, you must spend like an entire day writing your posts. I'm like, no, it's just like, I don't know. It's like, it's fun, mm. you know? And he's like, no, it's not. <laughs> like, <laughs> nobody does that. And I was like, really? And it, it that was the first, he's like, yeah, you should like start a blog or something. Like, if you think that's fun, you should be writing all the time. And uh, never crossed my mind. Never even occurred to me. I got all the way through high school and college, never once considering I'd write a book. And, uh, and I've since seen that in a lot of other people is that there is something in their life that they're very good at, that they love doing, but is so natural to them that it doesn't even occur that it's easy for them and hard for others. And so I, I think that's like, that's probably the best place to start looking. Mm. Like that's kind of, the universe's way of telling you like, this is where you're supposed to go. I, I truly believe that if you get masterful at anything, you can find a way to monetize it, right? And, For sure. And you're only to become masterful at something if you enjoy it and time passes and it feels like you, you know. Exactly. You it. Like it, it's, yeah. Yeah, you have to enjoy, even the sucky parts of it, you have to enjoy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and it's, I write about this in Subtle Art, but like the reason I didn't become a musician is because, not because I didn't love music, I do love music, but it's because I didn't love the bad parts of music. I loved playing music and I loved studying and listening to music. I didn't love pl practicing. I didn't love dealing with all the gear and the tech side of it. Uh, I didn't love like finding bandmates to like rehearse with and dealing with venues and shit like that. Like I hated all that. And so I never became a musician. And whereas with the writing, like, you know, sitting at home, in my underwear, revising the same paragraph, rewriting the same paragraph seven different times, that's fun to me. Like that's just, mm. that's like a, that's a great hour spent on like a Friday night. Yeah. And, um, and that's why I became a writer. Yeah, it just goes back to that initial point of not resisting what you don't want, but finding the finding the pain that's worth enduring to yep. you, you know, like that, that actually makes it worthwhile that, because like, if you want to be a podcaster or a writer, like, there's a lot of other ancillary skill sets that you need if you want to become proficient at that, right? Yep. That most people don't don't realize. But if you're willing to endure that pain because it means so much to you, then like, I think that's a really beautiful pointer to something that uh, is worth following. Because yeah, some of it is just a willingness to endure, but some of it is even it's enjoying. Yeah, like there's some people who just they really enjoy like mm. whatever sucks for you. There's somebody in the world who like, is like, no, I love that. For sure. <laughs> for those that haven't found that thing, is it just a matter of just trying more stuff? You feel like? 
I think it's a combination of trying more stuff, follow, like following curiosity. So I think what complicates this for a lot of people is people who, what I find is it's usually two types, there are two types of people that this gets very complicated for. The first one is that people who grew up with a lot of external pressure on them. So let's say somebody who grew up in poverty, right? It's like, you don't have the luxury to sit around and think about like, what do I like to do? Do I want to be a writer or a musician? Like, it's like, no, you have to get out of poverty. So it's like, they probably, you know, got into college, studied the, only studied the things that were going to get them in the college. And then once they were in college, they only studied the things that were going to make them the money so that they could get the hell out of the poverty right. they were in, right? So those people, what usually happens is they hit that, that, privileged question. And by the way, this whole question of passion and purpose, I always remind people, it's a privileged question. Back to the paradox of progress, right? Like you only get to ask this question if ever, if all the fundamental stuff in your life is taken care of. Right. Like if you know what you're eating, if you have a roof over your head, like yeah. this is when you get to ask this question. Um, so yeah, that first group, it's usually, you know, once they've achieved like a level of financial stability, usually maybe in their 30s, maybe 40s, they kind of look around, they're like, wait, I hate being a lawyer. Like, I actually want to do something that I care about, right? But they've never allowed themselves to explore what they care about. And so they actually have, have zero idea where to start. And so I think for those people, it's mostly just about not only exploration, but like developing the skill of exploration, developing the skill of like doing something simply for the sake of doing it and not expecting any sort of result. The second group of people I see that, that struggle with this a lot is I would describe as people who are very codependent in their relationships. So people who, for lack of a better term, uh, give way too many fucks what other people think about them. And so these are the people who usually do have something that they're very passionate about in their life, but they have not allowed themselves to accept that because they don't think it's appropriate. Like it would not be accepted by their friends or family or parents or whatever, right? So it's like, it's the kid who spends all of his free time nerding out over comic books, but won't admit to himself that that is, uh, you know, an acceptable thing to be passionate about because his parents would disapprove and his friends would laugh at him and, you know, whatever. So you, for those people, I think it's more about, um, recognizing what's already there and having the courage to actually stand up and be like, no, 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 I'm a comic book nerd. And like, <laughs> this is who I'm going to be. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm sure, I mean, of course it is a question of privilege, but at some point as well, down the path of being a writer, finding whatever your thing is, that identity that you created for yourself and that aspect can also become limiting, right? When you want to mm -hmm. explore other things <laughs> at different parts of your life. Totally. It becomes your new prison, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is why it never ends. <laughs> it's just, it never ends. Um, yeah, it's um, one of the liberating experiences for me recently is, is simply acknowledging that I don't have to be an author if I don't want to. Like, just because I sold all these books doesn't mean I have to be an author. Like, I can go back to build, like, fucking around on my website and, like, filming YouTube videos in my living room. Like, there's nothing saying I can't do that. And again, so this is a good example of external pressure, right? It's maybe, I. that's probably what I felt years ago. But, you know, when, like, Will Smith is showing up and being like, hey, dude, will you write my book for me? And you're like, you know what? F fuck my website. Let's go, <laughs> let's go write a book with Will Smith. You know, and that's not like, I, I loved writing the book with him, but I, I think it's just there, are, when the incentives are aligned for you to stay in this identity, like if you're being rewarded by the world to have an identity, it's very, very hard to, to refuse it. Yeah, you're just getting so, so many uh, positive affirmations and signals from all around you in society that this is, you're doing a good job, you're yeah. fine, you know, but it's it's coming back into checking with whatever those values are and what really has meaning for you. Um, because as you inevitably grow and evolve as a soul in, a, in, in this human meat suit, your values are going to change. Yeah. As you age, the things that you cherish are going to change and that's going to obviously change your behavior. Uh, but that's really beautiful that you do get 
opportunities. And I'm sure one of the most, you know, uh, I guess nourishing things that has come at, from a byproduct of the success is those connections and those networks and being able to work with mm -hmm. individuals that are super inspiring for you, right? And yeah. they're asking for your help. Yeah, I mean, look, it's cool as shit. Yeah. Like it's, it's um, I, I have no complaints or regrets whatsoever. And it's it's been, um, you know, even through the difficulties, like it's, it's growth, it's learning, it's yeah. experiencing. How how important do you feel like it is in partnership and romantic relationship for each person to find their own thing like that, that really uh, lights them up and have that kind of purpose and that drive as, I'm sure for periods, like have that be the priority. Yeah. And then also, you know, when family comes in, I'm sure things change, but um, yeah, how important do you feel like that is to have? It's key. It's re required. You know, you have to, you have to have separate identities within the relationship. Uh, it it doesn't. It's impossible for it to stay healthy. Otherwise, I think it's great to have. Like you need a little bit of both, right? You need shared values. You need shared projects and shared goals and worldviews. But you also need your own. And um, and I think it's by keeping your own healthy uh, is what keeps the mm. one the the together ones healthy. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Or, yeah, I think we're just under this whole, the whole notion of you complete me and finding, I think there's so many things that you can only find by virtue of being in union and partnership in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but like it, it is just a recipe for disaster if you lose yourself in that process, right? Yeah, it's it, it's funny too, because I, I think there's been a, a, a modern conception of romance I don't want to say modern because that makes it sound like recent. Like I'd say, you know, there was probably a hundred years of conception of romance that was actually very toxic and unhealthy. Um, st starting of like probably late 1800s all the way up through the rom-coms of the, the 2000s. Like it's just, and you get a lot of phrases and cliches like that. Like, oh, you complete me. You're my better half. Like you're all this stuff. It's, no. No, it's like, that's not how it works, <laughs> right? Like, it's great. It sounds nice, especially in a movie, you know, it, like a happy ending or whatever. But um, a healthy relationship is two healthy individuals who are healthy on their own, consciously choosing to invest and care and love each other on a daily basis, whether whether they feel good or bad. And they are going to feel both good and bad frequently. So it's... um. I, I, I've written before that I think romance is overrated. Not because it's not fun and it doesn't feel like it feels amazing, but I think kind of like the cultural notions around romance and mm. it's important. Like it's not overrated in how good it feels. It's overrated in how important it actually is. Like we're, we just don't have many examples of what healthy relationships look like because in every movie and every story, yeah, there always always some sort of trauma bonding because that's exciting, you know. It like, is. That's where the drama is. Yeah. <laughs> healthy relationships don't make for good cinema. No, <laughs> it, it's it's funny though. It's something that I've just noticed maybe like the last two or three years. I've started noticing relationship like healthier relationships in movies and mm. TV shows. Um, and then the ones that are unhealthy, like the, it's like very clear within the show that it, this is an right. unhealthy relationship. But like, if you go back and watch rom-coms from like the, the nineties or right. uh, eighty, it is horrifying. Yeah. It's like, dude, you are sick people. Like that guy's stalking you. Why are you rewarding this <laughs> behavior? Like that is not romantic. <laughs> Stop. Have some respect for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I, I oftentimes just in my like day to day life, washing the dishes, whatever, like. I, I like zoom out. Like I, I have this visceral experience where like I zoom out and like look and feel where I am on the spinning mud ball in <laughs> infinite space traveling at enormous speeds. Um, and I also think about the historical perspective of how so many people put pressure on the times that we live in. I understand a lot is at stake. My question is like your understanding of studying history and a lot of different prominent figures how have you been able to um, compare the time that we feel like we're in, which is so relative, like the past hundred years or like mm -hmm. the technological revolution in a larger, how important is it for us to put that in a larger context of human development? Because <laughs> we get so myopic in this little, little slot totally. of time of history that we're living in, but it is a blimp 
a little small blip in the in the vast horizon of our existence. Totally. And I think it's it's super, super important, especially, and again, I think this is something our generation is very bad at, is keeping a realistic point of view of how good and bad things actually are. Like, yes, there are huge problems in the world today, no doubt. And there's a ton of work that needs to be done. But if you even go back like two generations, it's fucking horrifying. Like just talking about movies, like just go back and watch like a popular movie from the 50s. I remember I was watching like there's a classic car, a uh, classic film called Streetcar Named Desire. I watched this a few years ago. It's like a cl- old Marlon Brando film. And Marlon Brando was like the Brad Pitt of the 50s. And I started watching this movie and he like just straight up like beats the shit out of the female lead in the middle of the movie and then like all the characters are just hanging out like nothing happened and i'm like what the <laughs> fuck dude <laughs> holy shit like this would this would never get made today like right. ever it wouldn't even get like if, if somebody came in and pitched that script right. today like <laughs> they would be banned from hollywood for the rest of their career so it is very easy to lose sight of how rapidly things have changed and 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 so much time and attention, especially in news media, social media, is spent on how th- the things that are wrong in the world, the things that have gotten better in the world get don't get enough airplay. And for me, I think reading history today is so, so important to understand that, is like to understand how much worse things were not even 50 years ago, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, and then if you want to go a couple hundred years back, I mean, you're talking about literally 95% of the planet's population uh, living day-to-day subsistence, right? Like 90% of the planet's population can't read, doesn't have clean water. Like there's no comparison. <laughs> there's no fucking comparison. Like the life expectancy, even just five generations back is like half of what it is today. It's mind blowing. It's crazy. It's it's powerful when you put like even just some of those understandings in context because we are continually fed by negative news and media that like we are so doomed and yeah. of course, like you said, of course there's big problems that we're facing, like yeah. a lot of a lot of huge ones, and it's it's been so bad for for very long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in comparison, I mean, it's it's I don't think there's ever been a time in history that there wasn't some world ending cataclysm like on the horizon, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's before climate change, it was the Cold War and nuclear war. And before the Cold War, it was World War II, which by the way, if you ever want to feel better about our time, just go buy a book on World War. Doesn't matter what part of World War II, (laughs) just buy any book about World War II and you're like, all right, things are pretty good. (laughs) Um, You know, it's, before that, it was the Great Depression. Before that, it was World War One. Like it, it just gets worse the further back you go, and it, there's no time where it's like, you know, and you get get a little bit further back than that. And it's like, oh, the slave trade, right? Like, thirty percent of the world's population is enslaved. Great. Like, there's no time it was better than now, and there's no time that more people in the world had more opportunity than today. There's no time in the world that there was more equality than today. That's not to say that. Things are good, but things are so much better and they're getting so much better at a very rapid rate. So it's strange because it's like I've carved out a very awkward philosophical position for myself because on internal stuff, I'm always reminding people to recognize and focus on the negative, like acknowledge your negative emotions, accept the negative experiences in life, understand that like trauma doesn't completely go away. Uh, but then on the external world, I'm like, dude, things are amazing. Like, I'm like very optimistic about life and the world in general. And um, and so I, I think it, I just like, I lose people on both sides. <laughs> sure, sure, it's inevitable. And I very much feel like there will always be that contrast of experience of, of just like in the, the dimension of the human experience, there's just the polarities, right? Like yeah. of, of light and dark, of positive and negative. And I think, it's so beautiful that we can be so empowered with being able to be so connected, Mm -hmm. like having this, this medium form and like be able to speak to people on the other side of the planet. Such a gift. It's insane, man. Like, yeah. If you, if we just take a moment and think about what's actually happening, right? Like two dudes are sitting in Topanga and this could be watched by hundreds of thousands, listened to by hundreds of thousands, millions of people 
all over the world. People will never meet. I, it's mind blowing. It's very strange. It's absolutely mind blowing. <laughs> <laughs> it's very strange. But like when I tap into that realization, I I feel so giddy and excited that transformation on a global scale is so possible yeah. and in many ways inevitable if just the right minds and hearts come together to continue having these discussions and start to be curious and mm -hmm. explore possible ways in which we can find more freedom within and without. Um, and I think we just, just give it some more time, right? But then also there is the other side of things with the the advent of AGI and the rise of exponential technologies that could lead to a dystopic world, right? <laughs> yeah, and that, right. that that possibility is there. But like you spoke to, there's no generation in our past that hasn't faced some sort of cataclysmic event upon the horizon. Yep. And we're facing our own version of that. There's also, like I also note that there's there's never been a major technology that has come along that hasn't also inspired a large percentage of the population to think that it's going to destroy the world. Like it's, mm. if you go back to like when television was invented, people are like, this is going to rot people's brains. Like nobody's going to read anymore. The population is going to become stupid. You know, <laughs> they're partially right about that one. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but yes. You go back to radio, same thing. Sure. You go back to the printing press, same thing. Like you can even, like if you go back to apparently somewhere Plato wrote, he complained about how young people, this is like 200 30 BC, he was complaining that the invention of parchment paper was uh, going to ruin young people's memories because they didn't have to memorize poems anymore. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, the young people are screwed because they have, they have parchment paper to write their poetry. <laughs> <laughs> so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what is it about just innovation? I got people just fear it's change. It's scary, huh? man. Yeah. It's scary. Change is scary. It's, yeah. We avoid what what yeah, no. changes our identity, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Before we wrap up that whole, like, is there one moment in history that you've looked back at that has been most fundamental in your own perception shift of like how, um, whether it's in regards to the possibility of the human spirit and somebody that's endured something that's extremely challenging or just a, a time and era that you think is is important for people to, to remember in this time? I'm a huge World War II history nerd and... It's funny because the more I read about World War II in the lead up to World War II, the more it just like my jaw is just on the floor all the time that this actually happened. And not only did it actually happen, but there are people, I mean, they're almost gone now, but there are, there's still one or two people even in my family that lived through it and saw it. Um, I don't think we've ever come closer to like a civilizational collapse than we did during the mid 20th century and the amount of group think that took over like such large populations and the sheer number of millions of people that willingly died for kind of nothing. It, it's absolutely shocking. And it's, um, and again, I think it comes back to, it's like you to bring it full circle, you know, the same way that you want to be able to think about your own death, realistically to to understand what you should be grateful for in life i think it's useful to look at these cataclysmic events in human history with a very sober eye and think about them deeply because that's ultimately what helps us be grateful for what we have today and all the people that sacrificed so that we can be here today i kind of want to like wrap it up at that no i think <laughs> we've explored a lot of really interesting topics uh and you provided a lot of beautiful, fresh perspective on a lot of them. And um, so just thank you for your passion of study and sharing it with the world in this way. Is there anything else that you want to share with this audience or just in general before you start to wrap up? No, man, I'm good. Feel good. This is fun. Yeah, yeah, this is good. We'll have to run it back at some point. Uh, but people can find you. You're in a movie now, dude. You're I know. Documentary. I have a movie. I've, yeah, it's weird that's cool <laughs> i watched it it's fun thanks, i love man. the disappointment panda thanks and the, dude the visual of that is really satisfying <laughs> it's so strange like i got friends like friends are like watching it on airplanes and like taking pictures and sending them to me i'm like what that's so strange <laughs> yeah. it's cool it's just another form of medium and it is expression. it is that ultimately it is just another medium but yeah but yeah it's um there's you know in the movies like it's, yeah. i don't know there's some like cultural weight put mm. on it yeah and right now you're really focused on youtube this year right yeah content creation videos yeah youtube videos just video creation in general so 
Amazing. Anything else you want to point people towards or that feel good? Yeah. Uh, markmanson.net. All my books are everywhere. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Do what you want. <laughs> uh, great. Well, from World War II to rubber band balls to <laughs> deep existential trauma and emotional healing, we've come full circle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for coming on. Everybody that's been tuning into this episode of the Know Thy Self podcast, thank you for coming on the journey please hit the subscribe button if you feel called and come on this journey of knowing ourselves deeper and deeper every single week. Thank you for joining this family. Until next time, be well.